This is the Guy Gordon Show on News Talk 760 WJR. So the main uh, political news today is that Kevin McCarthy and the House Republicans laid out their agenda for what they will do when and if they regain the majority in Congress. And uh, it is more of a broad set of goals and ambitions and pledges on principle than it is an actual manifesto of how to get there. But uh, whether it's... Uh, whether it's crime, whether it's inflation, uh, they've got a lot of agenda items, and they say we're going to make this constituent-based and focused and deliver on it. Uh, so will it work? Also, Tudor Dixon raising some eyebrows and drawing some fire for trying to change the conversation on abortion. We welcome in David Dulio, uh, professor of political science and director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. Uh, David Dulio, good afternoon and happy Friday. Good afternoon, Guy. Nice to talk to you as always. Good to talk to you. So, you know, political lore would herald Newt Gingrich as a genius for doing something similar with his contract for America, you know, nearly 30 years ago. It's an old play out of an old playbook. Will it be effective in this highly partisan modern era? We'll have to wait and see on that. But I think for now, it's a really smart move. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One, many of the issues that uh, this plan unveiled by Leader McCarthy and, and other Republicans today are at under the top of the list of concerns for Americans, right? And it may not be the top ones for, for each person out there, but they are issues that resonate with a lot of folks. In addition, uh, I, I think Republicans are trying to give voters not – just in their base, but trying to reach to uh, a group of voters that they've had trouble with recently, uh, if we're being honest about it, into the, the moderates and the independents. And they're trying to give them a reason to vote for Republicans, not just against Democrats in this upcoming midterm. And, and I, I agree. I think anytime you can lay out a list telling people exactly what you intend to do, you can kind of clear the clutter as they try to make the agenda about something else. And we've seen this with abortion. Uh, Democrats seem to want to talk about nothing but. I want you to listen to what Tudor Dixon did in an in interview. Um, this was on a, I believe, with a, with a blogger. And she's drawing some fire for it. She wants to steer the conversation away from abortion, and I understand that. But it's the what, what she says and the way she does it. Here's what she had to say as she kind of wanted to sidestep the issue. Cut six. I've shared my personal stance. This is not an issue that the governor has an impact on. This would have to go to the legislature. But as you know, a judge has just ruled on abortion in the state of Michigan. It's also on the ballot. This is up to the people. The fact that this has come up as an issue is what I called out on Twitter the other day. This is not an issue in the governor's race. How will that fly, David? She made her pro-life credentials one of the central points of her primary campaign. It is still one of the big agenda items on her website. But she says, yeah, this isn't an issue for a governor. Has she not heard about the veto? Does she not know that you can file suit, that you control an executive branch that has health and human services under its umbrella? Yeah, you know, what I think she's trying to do is, is uh, well, it's clear what she's trying to do, right, is to, is to get this governor's race back on some turf where she has an advantage over Gretchen Whitmer, whether it's on the economy, sure. or COVID policies, uh, you know, but to I, say I, I that, have no control, it's not an issue for a governor. Is, is that disingenuous? I'm not so sure it's disingenuous. I think she's, she's obviously just relating it to the fact that we're going to have this ballot proposition, right? Where the, that's going to, if it passes, and abortion rights into the Michigan Constitution. Um, now, that could be uh, potentially uh, nibble that, right? I mean, as uh, through other laws that would get passed and, to your point, signed by the governor. Uh, I, I think it's actually a moot point because uh, the timing on this is, is bad for Tudor Dixon. It, it, everybody already knows, <laughs> thanks to all of the ads that that uh, Governor Whitmer and her allies have been airing, they mm -hmm. know where she stands on this, and it's out there as a uh, as a main issue in this in this election. And she's going to have a hard time sidestepping it or or changing the agenda. 
Yeah, I should point out there, by the way, too, that she was uh, talking with Rachel Louise Just at RLJ News. Uh, that's where we got that sound by. Yeah, I don't know. If I'm a pro-life Republican and I voted for her because I knew she was going to be a pro-life warrior, I don't know that how it would sit with me. She says, well, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do much for you as governor on that. Uh, I that that. I, it'll just be interesting to see how that's processed. I got to ask you about Nolan Finley raised something in his column today uh, that kind of lowers the boom on Donald Trump and says, "Hey, you're sitting on an estimated one billion dollar war chest. You foisted a lot of these candidates up on us, and and other more mainstream candidates were shunted aside, and yet you're sending no money to these people. Is that a legitimate complaint? Absolutely. Uh, it's you know the we we can only assume that. Donald Trump made these endorsements earlier in the cycle because he wanted to see those folks elected. Well, now some of those same folks are having some real trouble in the general election. And if there is all of this campaign cash that's that's sitting there and there's there, I've been reading rumors in the last couple of days about how, you know, he might try to transfer it to another entity, which he could then use to support a, a 2020 presidential bid. Well, it. it now is the time to help these candidates in the in the last seven or eight weeks of the campaign. Uh, and he has an interest in doing that. Should he run and, and win in 2024, right, he would want to have some of these folks around in office to, to help his uh, legislative agenda, which is obviously, you know, we're talking eons from now in politics. But, right. but you know, if, if he's going to uh, help Republicans and he's got a bunch of money, spending that money in their support is the way to do it. Yeah, it's hard to say that you're the champion of the MAGA agenda when you won't support your your acolytes here. Um, so, and that it, he may suffer some of the blame when these folks uh, go down. When you the the market law poll came out uh, yesterday, and it helped me understand this. It says that economy continues to be the number one issue against all other issues combined. And yet, we see Joe Biden's approval rating jump nearly nine points from July. How how is he not being held accountable? Well, I think if we in the short term, in the last four or six weeks, the economic news, aside from the stock market taking a hit uh, pretty badly when the the Fed announced their uh, seventy five basis point rate increase, you know we. The, the economic news has not been as bad as it was. Uh, so I think that there's, that that's part of it. I think, uh, the White House has done a nice job of, uh, moving, uh, attention away from economic issues onto other things. Uh, and, and that's no doubt helped. Now, if we start to, to again see whether it's continued declines in the market, whether it's an uptick, say, in the, uh, unemployment rate, or the next time we get a, um, a quarterly economic uh, report that will give us GDP numbers, um, and, you know, if that is a negative number for the third straight quarter, yeah. they're going to have a hard time uh, walking back the talk of recession, which will really, uh, I think, put a dent in those in those job approval numbers again. Well, we, we saw oil fall to almost 80 bucks a barrel today, not because things have gotten better, but because things have gotten worse and the market's anticipating a, a, a recession. Uh, so he may benefit because gas prices are lower, but it's not going to be for the right reasons. Very quickly, before I let you go, Nate Cohen of uh, of the uh, New York Times had that analysis I've heard, I'm sure you've heard of, talking about that the error that we saw in polling in 2016 – is still here in 2022, and that a lot of the encouraging news that Democrats are seeing in polls may be a mirage. What do you think about that? I think that's decidedly possible. Uh, you know, pollsters have a really hard job these days, and they're, they're, the key factor that they have to try to, to work out is to anticipate and predict what the electorate is going to look like on Election Day. Mm -hmm. That is exceedingly difficult, really tough job for pollsters these days. Yeah, it is. I understand. By the way, uh, you've got some important events coming up, and I want to give folks a chance to uh, see you. Oh well, thanks. Thanks for that, guy. We, you know, we're uh, we're going to engage on that abortion issue at at Oakland University. We're going to have a Lincoln Douglas style debate uh, virtual uh, on October 11th at 7 p.m. between two uh, nationally known women uh, thinkers on this issue. Uh, 
Jill Filipovic is a CNN columnist.